a food ethos for me really is to, to make it nice or make it twice. Hey, my name is Anthony O'Connell. I'm a man with a high voice and a podcast. We do a feast or pass, rate right it one to feast, great dining experiences and more. What's up with the name Preston's? Preston was my grandfather. Uh, he was not known uh, for making a delicious cheeseburger, though. You know, it's just a way to pay homage to, you know, my family and my past. That's cool, man. So we're going to get into the restaurant biz and all that fun stuff. But first, I like to open it up with Feast or Pass. Filet of fish from McDonald's, Feast or Pass. I'm going to go with Feast, but only under special circumstances. You know, every once in a while, you got something you want. Like, sometimes that's what I want. So when that's what I want, that's what I want. <laughs> you ever do the double fillet? That's kind of a, a bold move. That's from way way back in the day. I think uh I think I gave it a shot. It felt like just too much. Yeah, it's a lot for sure. I don't know if that might be a hard pass for you, but I guess guess you're pretty No, sure. I like I like trash. I like garbage. But, you know, I <laughs> I want to eat the best version of like what it is that exists. So if I go to McDonald's, I just want it to be really good McDonald's. I don't need it to be something else. So, you know, like I have my cravings that I fill in and my meals that I grab when I'm just like running around and have to put some food inside of myself. So yeah, I'm not a food snob in, in any sense of the word. With with burgers, like a good, like a fast casual, Five Guys versus Shake Shack. Ooh, Team Shake Shack. You know, like I had Shake Shack for the first time when I was in out in D.C. Um, I lived there for a while working in fine dining. And when they came to D.C., it was like a really, really big deal. And I went to Shake Shack and I'd never had a burger like that. It was, it was kind of a life changing moment. I also really like Five Guys. So, you know, like I happen to pick a team to be on between those two is, is tough, but I'm going to go with Shake Shack. Dude, I'm with you. They're both phenomenal. For me, the reason I would choose Shake Shack is because their chicken sandwich is amazing. Their burger is amazing. Five Guys has the amazing burger, but I don't think they, you know, they don't have a chicken sandwich. They don't have a chicken sandwich and their fries don't stand the test of time, right? Like they're really, really good for like for eight minutes. Um, I do like how everything gets wrapped up in that foil and turns into this like really kind of like moist, like glob of indistinguishable deliciousness. <laughs> Indistinguishable deliciousness. I love that. So when you were in DC working fine dining, were you front of the house or back of the house? Uh, back of the house, for the most part. I did a stint at a place in Alexandria uh, where I worked as a bartender. Um, I was really just trying to throw myself into the restaurant and into the deep end of the, you know, the kind of the upscale restaurant scene. And, you know, I looked at New York. I was out in uh, Santa Barbara for a little while. I thought about Chicago but, and I thought about New York, but D.C. felt like a middle place between like Columbus, where I grew up, and New York, which felt like it was way, way too fast paced for me. That's fair, man. Did working in a fine dining kitchen, like what kind of skill set did that give you for your much more casual burger joint? Well, you know, it was more of an aesthetic, I think, because if you're going to do something, do it. You know, like if you have if you want something to taste like something specific, if you have an ethos, if you have if you have an idea, if you have opinions about what food should taste like, you should really work to play that up so you know we we always went you know to the max with everything you know if something was supposed to taste like carrot you know we took we got the best carrot and then we cooked it in some carrot juice and then we like based it down with some carrot butter you know like we really worked to reinforce those flavors and so those techniques really carried forward and you know a lot of like research and paying attention to what we're doing and 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 what has become kind of a, a food ethos for me really is to to make it nice or make it twice. And that's the thing that, you know, I've heard in a, I've seen on walls in tons of really nice restaurants, heard from a lot of like really good cooks. I have no idea where it came from, <laughs> but it's the thing that, you know, we talk to our cooks all the time about, you know, do a good job, make it the right way. And if it's not right, just throw it away, start over. Because I think people will appreciate waiting a couple more moments for something great than to get something that's just okay, you know, that, that came out a little bit faster. Yeah, absolutely. And especially at that price point, it better be perfect. So I would much rather wait. And I love that. Make it, what is it? Make it nice or make it twice? Make it, make it nice or make it twice. Yeah. Ooh, that's great. That like gave me chills thinking about that. That's really inspiring. Hey, just wanted to say thank you so much for listening so far. If you're liking it, please subscribe, tell a friend. If you're loving it, please give us a five-star review. So now we're going to move on to one to feast. It's kind of like one to five, but we say feast for branding. The Wendy's Baconator, one to feast. Probably mark that at a two, maybe a three. It used to be a five for me, like way, way back in the day, before I like left to go work in, 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 in restaurants at all. That was my go-to. And then I had it after I had a little bit of like training and exposure and ate some cheese that wasn't American. <laughs> and I realized that, you know, that was, that's the weak point of that, of that whole sandwich. It's not the American cheese. It's that cheese sauce. Like it's not great. 
<laughs> the rest of that burger is really well thought out, but that cheese sauce really like brings it down a little bit for me. So actually, I'm gonna hang out at three. I'm with you, man. And I think another company that dropped the ball with the cheese sauce is Chipotle. Like I love Chipotle, but their queso for me is probably like a one and a half or a two. It's a it's a real missed opportunity. It's funny because like when that first came out, I ran. I was we were doing burgers upstairs at um at a uh, three sheets on um, South High Street. I like went down to Chipotle and I got out. Like I'm gonna give it a shot. Uh, and I tasted it. It was just a broken sauce, which is their issue. I understand that Chipotle's got this, you know, like we do natural, you know, no ingredients, you know, or, or, or no artificial ingredients. But, you know, that sodium citrate to like bind that sauce together is really, really important because it just can't tolerate being at the heat that they need to keep it at. I took it back to where we were working and I put it in a blender with a little bit of like water to like re-emulsify it. And their original sauce is delicious. Really? If you got it, if you got it the way that they wanted you to have it, not broken, which it is going to be after it's been on a hot well for, you know, 45 minutes. Like, it's delicious. Um, it's just like a, a difficult thing to deliver it, I think, the way that they want you to get it. Do you think if they had better training or something, they could keep it to not break? Because it seems like a feasible it's, solution. You know, like, uh, part of it, I think, is just health code. You can't hold anything below a certain temperature. Above that temperature, however, that sauce is going to break. So they can't hold it at a lower temperature they'd have to like heat it up to order to be able to do that. And that's not something that I think they can execute. And there's just like a, a little bit of magic powder. They could sprinkle it in there, but they don't want to do that, which I mean, I respect that. I get it. Yeah. Teach their own. So this is kind of a vague one, but I feel like it's super hot on the food scene. Maria tacos, one to feast. Feast, super feast. You know, I, there's good and bad execution of everything. I've had some, you know, super okay burrito tacos. I've had some excellent burrito tacos, like done well. I mean, it's everything you want. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a French dip from south of the border. Like, it's amazing. Dang, dude. You're like catchphrase central, man. I love it. <laughs> French dip from south of the border. That's a fact, though. That consomme is so good, man. Like, Yeah, it's so good. It's it's the thing that, like, tacos are great. I'm not even normally, like, a soup guy. Tacos are great, but you dip it in that, and it really, like, brings it up a lot. Also, you know, like, frying it off in that fat that comes from that braise mm -hmm. is a real, you know, like, it's a pro-level move. Uh, I think Los Agaves is really good. Love AJ's Bria. Those are kind of the two that jump out at me. Like, do you have any other ones that are super good? In town, nothing's, like, nothing springs to mind like agave is really really good you know we seek that out occasionally you know i spend a lot of time pressing burgers though so <laughs> it kind of cuts down on it cuts down on my on my taco seeking behavior that's fair so do you have any um unpopular food opinions i'm sure i have plenty <laughs> like I'm, I'm sure i have a ton so let me give you an example my buddy whenever we go out to eat like we he's one of my foodie friends we eat out a lot he always eats all of his french fries before one bite of his burger because he said fries are like on a time crunch. So he won't even take one bite of the burger. All that's the fries. fair. Honestly, that's completely fair. I don't even, that shouldn't be unpopular. I mean, I, I don't think that's got to be the way you, I mean, you don't have to be such a hardliner about it. But if somebody did that, I'd be like, no, that makes some sense to me. Maybe I'm just a hater. Because to me, I was like, that's so weird. <laughs> I don't like the two uh, American sauces, uh, ketchup and ranch. <gasps> <laughs> because uh, I just they go on everything. I think it's more annoyance to me of working in so many places and having to like make ranch for people asking for ranch to put on everything and dipping everything in ranch and dumping buckets of ketchup on everything. Uh, they're just really strong, aggressive flavors that I feel like belong in some places, but not everywhere. So, you know, those are things that people love that I'm not a huge fan of. Like I wouldn't have ketchup if I felt like I could not, sell, not have ketchup. That's fair. When I used to work at in Times Square, which is like a family style Italian restaurant. And we did not have ketchup or ranch. And it was people hated it, especially because we we're kind of a tourist trap. And I remember one time I actually talked about this on the podcast before, but this dude ordered shrimp scampi and he asked for ketchup. I was like, I don't have any ketchup. He pulled out ketchup out of his backpack and just put ketchup all over the shrimp scampi. Did you did you guys did you throw him out? No, I mean I gasped. Like my first You don't thing, deserve we don't deserve this shrimp scampi. Get up and get out right now. <laughs> As a server, I try not to judge people. Like if they order a steak well done, I'm like, whatever, I'm not eating it. But that one kind of stuck out to me. Like, dude, this is- No, that's over the line. That's over the line. <laughs> yeah, it is. Get out, get out of here. Get out of New York. Get out of town. There's a bounty on your head now. Exactly. Plus it was outside food or beverage. So even if maybe I pretend, let's pretend I love ketchup. Sure, this outside food or beverage, you gotta go. <laughs> you gotta get out of here right now. So with no ranch though, you, you sell chicken wings at Preston Burgers. Do you not like ranch on your chicken wings? I don't. You know, I like to have a little blue cheese around, like in the area, so I can put my celery in it. Because I always, 
I do always eat all of my celery before I like, I make sure if I'm going to take something home with me, mm -hmm. it's the wings. I always eat the celery. You're I man. want blue cheese. I don't want ranchers. <laughs> That's what that is. <laughs> I'm glad you called that out. I'm glad you, I'm glad you picked that up about me and my You're chicken wings eating habits. Yeah. yeah I have to get my negative calories in first, uh, after I dip it in blue cheese dressing. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, I'm not. So yeah, that question, you know, when you order wings, they're like, you want ranch or blue cheese? I don't I just feel like there shouldn't be a question. Just blue cheese. That's it. I don't dip my chicken wings in that. Though. But how do you feel about aioli? Because I feel like ranch is just kind of a low class aioli. I have to get off this call right now. Honestly, I don't. <laughs> feel uncomfortable. We have, we, have some, we have some really serious philosophical disagreements about how things are in the world. And mayonnaise is a different thing. Aioli, mayonnaise, you know, kind of kind of different things. You know, I, I feel like um, that that fatty richness of an aioli or a mayonnaise, you know, comes into play in some places. I would rather, much rather have a French fry dipped in aioli or, or, or mayonnaise or like just straight up plain mayonnaise than in ranch. I feel like it's kind of a, a good foil. It's got to be horrible for you, but. Yeah, absolutely. So being that you, you said that you love trash food and you also work in fine dining, what, what does a great dining experience mean to you? And it's probably untethered from that. It's probably untethered from those two things, really. For me, a really, really good dining experience is, is a, is, is very experiential. You know, you, you go to a place and, you know, I think that the food being well executed and delicious to be at the top of the list of, of what I want out of it, but going a place where I feel like I'm getting an experience that I can't have anywhere else is, it has, has been really important to me. Those have been the places that have really stood out to me in, in, in all of my like dining experiences. So you go somewhere, you have really, really good service uh, because people really like where they work. They really think the food is great. You know, they really believe in, in, in what they're doing. I feel like those experiences are the best experiences. Service is very important. Also, I feel like who you're with is super important. Like if you're with a really good friend or someone you care about, I think you could eat literally anything and have yourself a time. Hey, I think that helps. I think that helps out a lot. I'm also a pretty solitary uh, guy. Uh, so, you know, like going to the movies, going out to eat, those are all things that I'm fully down to do on my own. Uh, some of my best dining experiences have been on my own uh, because they've been at places that, you know, just really nailed it. Like the food was super good, but then also uh, the experience and the care that people put into everything else around that was was really impactful on me. That's cool. So when you go out to eat alone, do you, would you sit at the bar or just a table for one or just whatever your mood is? Probably, uh, probably the bar, you know, there's some direct and a little bit less formal interaction at most bars, you know, uh, you go eat at a, at a super fine dining restaurant at a table, uh, the service there. Um, when you go out to eat, uh, somewhere extremely fine dining, it's just really, really, it can be a little stodgy and a little, and a little sticky sometimes. And at the bar, it tends to be, you know, kind of edged down just a little bit from that. For sure. Could you tell us a little bit about your origin story of Preston's Burgers? So Preston's uh, started out, you know, back in the day, I think it's been almost three years now. It was a, it was a pop-up. It was the Ambrosini Burger Shack upstairs at uh, Three Sheets. Uh, I was partners with Katie Randazzo at that point. We were trying to get people kind of primed and ready for us to move into that neighborhood, you know, down the street uh, with Ambrose and Eve. And we ran a junk food pop-up and it was pretty popular. Um, you know, this, that burger is a burger that I've been working on for a while. You know, I used to have a food truck way, 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 way. Also another way back in the day called Swoop. Um, we did little slider versions, you know, with a spicy sauce, American cheese. Um, when I was at the Flatiron, we did a burger like that. That was really popular. So I've kind of been like working on pushing that on down the road. But I feel like, you know, at that point, I wasn't interested in, in I'm, a, I'm an improver. I make something one time. No, oh, that's good. But how can I make it better? Okay, that's that's better. How can I make it better than that? I had gotten to a point with the burger where I felt like I couldn't make it any better. Uh, and then when Ambrose and Eve opened, you know, the plan was for that to just go away. Uh, but it was a really popular thing. So we put another name on it. I Ambrose and Eve was named after Katie's uh, grandparents, Preston, my grandfather. And that's, you know, kind of how everything started. That's really cool. And so you, when did you go into the North Market? Uh, we opened in the North Market. Uh, I think about four months ago, you know, it was, uh, something that we had talked about, uh, and made some plans. You know, I, I feel like Preston's has the ability to be, you know, like our, like the Midwest Shake Shack, the Midwest in and out the Midwest, you know, the Ohio, at least burger. I think it's, you know, I think it stands toe to toe with, you know, any other burger in, in the region. So trying to make some growth plans, uh, in the North market, felt like a really good consolidation and jumping off point 
uh, to, to, to hopefully see that brand grow. Dude, that's so cool. It sounds like you have really big lofty goals. Do you have like a time frame? Like, are you trying to like, are you just playing it by ear at this point? I want to have 300 stores in two years. No, that's not. It's not, it. reason, it's not, that's not reasonable. That's not reasonable. Hey, you're a dreamer. <laughs> I wouldn't step on your dreams. Like if, if that was honestly how you felt, I'd be like, good luck, dude. <laughs> uh, you know, just try to actually build a really solid plan uh, and structure, make everything as replicatable as possible. You know, make sure that our supply line can hold up to suspend, so, some expansion. We'll kind of see how it goes. You know, I feel like at this point, I don't want to be over overly optimistic coming out of a pandemic, you know, like moving into a, a, a period of uncertainty for a lot of people. You know, it feels like we're headed back towards normal, um, but we're definitely not there yet. So, you know, I think the time frames will come later. Now, when you say you work so hard to constantly improve that burger, which obviously you have because it's phenomenal, but I want to get down to like the nitty gritty of it. Like, are you talking like let the meat sit out for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, or like, like literally how hard you press down on it, like all that stuff, or was it kind of just practice? You weren't that cognizant of it. No, I mean, it's been pretty, it's been pretty intentional, you know, like the evolution of the sauce, you know, there are a couple of things that have been uh, stables from the beginning, you know, like an 80, 20 uh, 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 whole animal grind. Uh, so you get some diversity of flavor, but now there's a little bit of like dry aged fat in the grind, you know, and that gives you a little extra sour, a little bit of extra interesting, you know, on the, on the food truck, we were putting arugula on it and that was a horrible, <laughs> stupid thing. <laughs> it was like, it was, it was a really bad idea. I, I didn't know it was a bad idea. Right. It does. It's good. It's good in a lot of really good places on a hot burger. It just turns into, you know, like arugula sauce really quickly. Yeah. So it didn't, it didn't stand up to that, but getting to iceberg lettuce, you know, that was a, that was some progress. Uh, and then, yeah, down to even like the actual technique of pressing the burger. It's a thing we spend a lot of time teaching to the people that work the grill. You know, we hand form, you know, all the burger balls, how to season them, how to press them, washing the edges for the right color and the time to flip. If you flip in it, it's not right. It's kind of gone. You got to start over. Uh, so yeah, it's just been a lot of, a lot of actual detail and paying attention, like the pickle evolution, you know, the pickles have changed a lot from the first time that I started to roll off a burger like this. Why can't you flatten it before you put it on the grill? So part of what we do, uh, uh that makes Preston's like that burger as good as it is, is we maintain a really, really clean griddle. You know, most cooking services, you, uh, most most uh, most regular cooking services, uh, if you're cooking something like a burger or you're frying something or you're sauteing chicken, you want a nice seasoned surface um, so that the food doesn't stick to it. You know, so uh, when you when you flip it or you pull it up, it doesn't you know rip it apart. We maintain a, a, a non-seasoned surface so that the burger does stick. So when you press that burger and that pressure makes a really, really flat surface, against the grill, it caramelizes in a way. It's actually a, a, a chemical reaction called the Maillard reaction. This is the proteins start to convert to a, a, a type of sugar. Uh, when you do that, you just get a really, really special, like crispy edge, you know, slick, texturally interesting thing that has a lot of really deep flavor. So, you know, we just kind of have to do it the way we have to do it. That's cool. I love your burger. And what I really enjoy about it is I feel like a lot of premium burgers nowadays, they make it so tall, you can't put it in your freaking mouth. Whereas your burger is like a normal burger, but everything is super elite on it. So you don't have to go really big and over the top. It's just like simple, but delicious, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think everything stands up to everything else. You know, like a bistro burger is something I feel like I want occasionally, but not very often. You know, like those thin patties with a lot of texture have always been, you know, it's always been something that uh, that appealed to me. What are your top three burger places in Columbus, Ohio? Oof. <laughs> I know that's a hard question. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's, that's, a, that's a hard question. There are a lot of good burgers uh, here in the city. I really like uh, the burger at Service Bar. It's a really rich burger. Uh, you know, like I have a hard time getting through it because it's, you know, it's, it's rich ingredients, rich sauce. Like the, the patty is like, is enriched also, I think with some bacon. Um, I really like the burger at Chapman's uh, Eat Market. Uh, I think Pat and Gracie's is doing a good job. I mean, I could probably name four or five of that. I am like a, a sucker uh, for, um, I'm, apparently I'm not that big of a sucker for it. Uh, the pepper burger at the bar in Clintonville, whose name I can't remember right now, probably That's because right. I feel so, super on the spot. Uh, I'd say those are also my best, my favorite burgers in town. Dude, Pat and Gracie's is so awesome. Have you ever done their mac and cheese bites? I think I just saw that on your, um, I think I just saw that on your feed today, actually. I've, I've never had them. It was a game changer. Like I went in with like super low expectations because uh, it was my first time going there. So I was like 
I've heard it's good, whatever. I went and got that. I got a burger, which was phenomenal. And I got the mac and cheese bites. Probably top three best I've ever had. And you dip it in nacho cheese. Yeah, I, I, I did I did peep that out. I feel like a I feel like fried macaroni and cheese needs, you know, like it does need some sauce and hopefully it's a cheesy sauce because you know, you take something that's supposed to be, you know, like moist and 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 you know, really kind of unctuous and 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 rich, and then you put it in the fryer and which in the the whole point of a deep fryer is to dry things out. Yeah, that's a good I'll have to give them a shot. I have to give them a shot the next time I go. You should. Have you ever had um, Third and Hollywood's cheeseburger? I have not. Actually, I don't think I've ever been in a Third and Hollywood. I'm a really big fan of there. I used to work there back in the day, so I'm a little biased, but they grind their own meat in house, which I think is really cool. It's like super fresh, delicious beef. 100% recommend that place. Thurman's, I feel like everyone knows Thurman's. Everybody does know. Everyone knows Thurman's. Do you have an example of like one of your best dining experiences ever? Probably have a couple and they're, they are Oh, they're different. And I, I think on the surface, they might sound the same because they're, you know, both pretty high end places. Um, there's a place in DC called Rose's Luxury, which to me is like, pro- is, is probably the ideal restaurant. Uh, it's my ideal dining experience because um, you don't have to dress. You don't, not only do you not have to dress any certain way, you don't feel like you have to dress any certain way. You know, when I went, the, the options for eating at that restaurant included getting in line, early enough to get into the restaurant there were no reservations there was no kind of there was there was no barrier to entry there you just had to be on time stand in line and get into the restaurant and same same with anyone else in the city the service staff had clearly bought into the 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 whole mode of the place you know it was it was like cool and casual and and meant to be fun and the food you know the food really held up uh to that on on kind of the other end for me is uh, I went to Del Posto uh, in New York, and that was one of the greatest meals of my life. The service was really, really formal. The meal lasted a very, very long time. Everyone was really, really nice and accommodating. But the, the food really shone, you know, above and beyond everything else. I mean, there are tons of there are tons of experiences I could probably give you of really, really good meals and dining experiences I've had. Those stand out. Man, formal dining. It. I always struggle with formal dining because usually the food is super delicious, but I'm the kind of guy where like, I get like uncomfortable when people are like pampering me and like going above and beyond common generosity. Absolutely. Like- Absolutely. <laughs> uh, especially when it feels as regimented. So, you know, they, I, what I like is that they did, they did all the same things at Roses that they did uh, at, at Del Posto, like all of the same things that the napkin folding, you know, the, the, the carried interest in me and, and the people around me and making sure that we were having a good time, you know, addressing us by our names, you know, once they learn them, uh, making sure that we enjoyed everything. They did all of those same things. The difference was, you know, like at Del Posto, everyone was wearing a suit and everyone was like super formal and it was very sir. And there was table crumbing and there were all these like really, really like fine uh, dining pieces and and the silverware was super duper fancy uh, and at roses everything felt a lot more like you know uh, a dining room at someone's house uh, where you were invited to a dinner party and you had a really 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 good time that's so fun now what do you think about uh with fancy dining i actually saw this before <laughs> someone had brought mio like little squirt flavor mio thing and they put it in their water which i thought was inappropriate what are your thoughts on that yeah, I'm a, I mean, that's like, that's making lemonade at your table with, with a couple of squ- uh, squeezes of lemon and and some and some sugar. I'm probably a no on that. Uh, yeah, it's inappropriate. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, like if you want something, if you want a soft drink, you want a beverage that doesn't taste like water, like you're at a place that can do that for you. Yeah, that's why I, the one cool thing about my job in Times Square was we were so busy that the customer was not always right. So when people would try to do the Mio thing, we were allowed to just charge them for soda. And I think that's totally fair. I think that's great. I was at um, Italy uh, and Italy and Chelsea has a big sign when you go into Italy, or at least they used to when I, when I the last few times I went. Um, and it said, uh, what did it say? We're not always right. The customer's not always right. Somewhere in the middle, you know, we'll have a good time or something like that. And I think that's a thing. You know, I think we maybe skewed a little bit too far towards the customer is always right uh, to the point where people get mixed up about the the definition of a server versus a servant. You know, like it's it's not the same thing uh, where people feel like they can abuse you and call you names and like be really mean and rude to you. You don't you don't have to love 
your server. You don't have to, you know, you know, like pamper them and tell them they're pretty and the greatest in the world. But there's not really a good, there's not really a good excuse for being mean to someone that's, you know, working their best to take care of you. Of course. And I think people like that, they don't have any power in their real lives. So when they have the smallest bit of power, they like to abuse it. And like when I was a server, I never took it personally when people were mean to me. I'm like, there's no reason for you to be acting like this. This is not me. This is you. Like, that's how I felt. Well, I, I feel like that's completely fair. The, the me, it's you. I think there's a couple of, there's probably, that probably comes from a few different places. Uh, some people it's, that don't have power, you know, every day in their, in their regular lives. Some people, it's just that they have so much power in their regular life that they don't know what it looks like to, to chill out. <laughs> they don't, they don't know what it's, they don't know what it looks like to not be able to point at someone and tell them to go do something right away and and not have them you know scamper off to do it because that's how they live their regular lives in any case like that's true I, i'm not down for any of that you know we, we don't we don't like let people abuse our uh, abuse our staff or you know treat us mean like you don't you don't have to be super nice to us we'll do our best regardless but you know when we cross that line of of being you know uninterested to being mean you know then then it's probably time to go. At the North Market, you probably don't get too much riffraff in there, do you? Uh, you know, the the North Market is a really diverse place. You have a lot of people that that you know, cycle through. And one of the things that I think we've had to deal with, and and all of us in the industry have had to deal with it. I was reading an article yesterday about that. Is the the thing with masks? There are a lot of people that just don't want to do it. Which you know, it's fine. I don't go home. <laughs> like you don't have to wear a mask at your house. That's fine. But at North Market, you have to wear a mask. And I've had you know a lot of you know, kind of unpleasant interactions. I had a, a delivery driver in uh, the other day and I was like, hey man, can you just like put a mask on? And he was like, I don't wear masks. And I was like, well, you don't pick up this food. I don't know what to tell you. And so then he puts on a mask kind of, you know, like under his nose. And I was like, well, you know, that's not, that's not what we're doing. I like show him a sign like, hey, here at the market, we have these rules. And he said, oh, the rules don't apply to me. I don't care about rules. And I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, you should probably cancel this pick up and have someone else come to get it because you know it's just not what we're doing and there's really no there's just no there's no reason to be that way dude i respect the hell out of you for standing up for yourself and it could have been a lot easier just to accept the produce and been like ah whatever but i think yeah, you, you'll, you'll be outside in 30 seconds and you take your mask off like i don't i don't understand you have it with you you took it out of your pocket and you put it on your face so like let's just get through this interaction as, as kindly as possible preston's burgers has top-notch ingredients and it seems like you really stand by your morals and you you're like a strong-willed kind of guy i say all that to say what would be your elevator pitch for your restaurant like if you were going to tell someone hey come check out my restaurant what would it be uh i don't know i'm bad <laughs> i'm bad at pitching uh <laughs> hey we work really hard at these burgers you should come eat them sold <laughs> <laughs> we do work really hard to to do our best you know everything's very well thought out um so you know come to preston's uh where at <laughs> bare minimum you know we thought really hard about your food <laughs> we make everything from scratch there you know we we make like all the sauces that we make there uh they're not you know it's not like we take mayonnaise and we mix something into it to make the special sauce we take the ingredients that we want the sauce to taste to taste like and we make a mayonnaise out of those ingredients you know like we, we're building everything from you know as close to the bottom up uh, so that you get as as far as we can to make it, you know, the experience, the exact precise experience that we want you to have. Uh, and it's not for everyone, but I think it should be. Dude, yeah, it's so good. And I really love your pastrami bacon. I think that's like a cool little fun thing, like just a nice little elevation there. It's a thing we have, like, a, there's a lot of conversation about, like, I don't want pastrami on my burger. My first response is, like, I don't know why you don't want pastrami on your burger, because that sounds delicious. But it's not pastrami, it's pastrami bacon. Can you make it not pastrami bacon? No, no, I can't. <laughs> it is pastrami bacon. That, that is what it is. Um, it is delicious. Um, but, you know, I think if I had my absolute rather, um, I would not have, I would just sell the classic burger. Uh, you know, we have those other burgers there because people want variety. And I stand by those burgers. I think they're delicious. But I think a, a classic double, I think when people ask me what my favorite burger is, that's my favorite burger on that menu because it's a really good ratio of everything, uh, you know, like stacked together. Uh, and it's simple enough that you can, you can taste everything, you know, like everything really stands out. I think that bacon and the, and the burger, I think they fight each other. I think it's like a delicious battle. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like everyone's a winner at the end of it. Uh, but I feel like, you know, those flavors compete with each other in a way that, you know, the classic single, you know, it's just a really, really good cheeseburger and, and you can, tell all the ways that it is a really good cheeseburger without having to figure out 
is that bacon? Is that the crust from the burger? Like, what is it? So Matt, um, I asked you everything I wanted to ask you, but I always ask my guests, is there anything I missed? If I dropped the ball on anything, now's your time to shine. No, I think it was a really, a really well done uh, podcasting experience. I don't know. I don't know if I've had one that's so well-rounded before. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. I really appreciate the support. I'm glad uh, that you like the food. Of course, yeah. <laughs> because that's what we're really, really trying to do is like make food that people really like. Awesome. Well, that's it for me. And uh, I love your food. I'm a big fan. I can't wait to come back in and up or feast again. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yep. Have a good day, buddy. You too.